Fiddle Podcast. The podcast dedicated to the music, movies, and culture of Generation X. What is up, Slackers, and welcome to another episode of the Stuck in the Middle Podcast. I am your host, Jason Eck. And do you remember the Conan O'Brien bit? You know the one in the year 2000. I'm not going to dare to do that falsetto in the year 2000. In the year 2000. Remember that whole bit? Well, what made it funny was that even after we rolled into the year 2000, they continued to do it. But part of it was this idea of prognosticating what the future was going to look like. And I will say that this is not the future that they promised, nor is it the future that they warned us about. It's kind of some stuff came true. Some stuff couldn't have been more wrong. Now, I don't want to get into the real doom and gloom stuff. We're going to keep it mostly into the realm of modern conveniences and what we thought we were going to get versus some things that are far, far off into the future, but also the number of things that they kind of got right. And part of it is always interesting of what came first, the idea from the minds of, let's say, Gene Roddenberry and Star Trek. Think about those communicators. Those are flip phones. I'm sure that was appealing to the people who first started making cell phones to say, hey, we're making communicators just like they did on Star Trek. What else did you have on Star Trek? You had the big screens for two-way communication. Well, that is a precursor to everything from, you know, Zoom to... Well, I, I'm on StreamYard right now, uh, FaceTime, all those kind of things, and all of it was thought about. Now, you could go back even further, though. You have someone like uh, George Orwell and Aldous Huxley, who have a couple of the most well-known dystopian future uh, novels of all time, whether it's 1984 or Brave New World, and I'm sure there is others. You know, there is... Um, Oh, Philip K. Dick, who did all the Blade Runner stuff, which, by the way, Blade Runner. Hey, man, what's the deal? Where's the flying freaking cars? But anyway, it's what came first and how much of it goes one way to the other. That's where when we start getting into the conspiracy theories about what is life. Are we in the Matrix? Are we in some weird TV show? It's all cinema. It's all staged. Now, I don't know how much or how little of what we consume is really happening behind the scenes. Who knows? And I'm not super well-traveled, really only traveled in the United States. I mean, we don't really count Bermuda, which is a couple hours off the coast of, you know, you can get there from Boston. You know, Canada, it's another country, but it's, do you know what I mean? So I, I haven't been to Europe, I'll be honest. I've I've never really had the opportunity, the wherewithal, the money, just a lot of different things. And I'd love to. I'd love to go see all that. But are the tensions and things that we see in the news that are happening in other countries or even wars that we're seeing? How much is real? How much is staged? And then how much of the things that were happening from the minds of creators was actually meant to be a specific kind of prelude to what was to come? Who knows? It's all interesting theory. The matrix is all interesting theory. I don't think we're going to find out in 20 years that we're all just major pieces of a, a battery for electronic organisms. However, there are many things that keep coming up, and we'll talk about it a little bit uh, in terms of the warnings that we do have about technology. And I'll just give you, you know, three examples as we get into it. You know, we have um, Hal from Kubrick's uh, Space Odyssey. We have Skynet from the Terminator series. And of course, we have The Matrix. All of those things do talk about 
uh, the warnings of AI. So we're not really even going to delve into AI. I find there are some great practical applica- uh, applications and uses for AI, as I mentioned last week. Other times it gets really, really frightening. And we're seeing the leaps and bounds that AI is making in a very short period of time because it's constantly learning. That's scary. That's really scary because it has cumulative data of all of mankind in the database, as well as new information that's constantly being fed into it and new things that come online. All very, very terrifying. But I did say Star Trek and the communicators. Let's start there. What the 60s got right and got wrong. Now, this is an old article because these things have uh, kind of always been interesting, I think. And one of the key things is talking about someone like uh, sci-fi author uh, Isaac Asimov, right? He kind of had ideas about what would be commonplace and normal. But one of the things that's really interesting, and it's kind of scary if you think about it, but it's not just Asimov. This is, this is actually Disney. So there's a a YouTube video, which you can find. Let's see if it's still available. I'm going to make sure it's still there. Holy cow. It is. So 1957, Disney's House of Tomorrow, which is brought to you by Monsanto. Hmm. Monsanto is a plastics company, which would explain the bizarre emphasis on plastic as the material of the future. Now it says, is everything made of plastic? Almost. Dishes, cups, countertops, walls, floors, ceiling, tabletops, shelves, and cabinets. Plastics and all their colorful, functional, and beautiful versatility. Obviously, we've come to know. Microplastics, and and I'm not one of these people who's like super crazy about all these different environmental things, but let's be honest. Microplastics are in everything, including our detergent, etc. So this is all so fascinating that it was sponsored by a plastic company. This is 1957. So for all the people who are like, Disney, blah, 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 in 2024, just look no further. I mean, corporate money has been flowing for a long ass time. But it says that... Uh, In the Disney future, you'll never unload your ultrasonic dishwasher. Your dishes will just stay there until you're ready to use them. I can say that having a house full of teenagers for one of their chores is to go ahead and empty the dishwasher. That's just, that's just life, not by design. Your thermostat controls let you dial up, uh, not just heat or cooling, but even the scent of roses or salty sea air. Some people do have scents in their home that are tied to things. And as it turns out, there's more technological progress predicted than social progress, because in all of these videos, the woman's place in the future land is still by the microwave oven. (laughs) Imagine how wonderful it'd be to live in a house like this, says the housewife putting on her apron. Just imagine, I'd be getting dinner in this kitchen. And then does the little, you know, gesture. Now, this is so interesting because I went to uh, Epcot and they had the the house of tomorrow and my dad was so fascinated by future tech and i mean this was in epcot too they call it tomorrowland i think so this was like the next logical step from just the you know um house of tomorrow it made it a whole exhibit kind of freaky and there were some early robotics and ai at epcot and let's see we went down there in 80 I want to say like 84, 85, somewhere around there, I think. Um, no, maybe even earlier than that. Maybe like 80, eh, at least 83, 84, somewhere in there. Anyway, uh, the British Broadcasting Corporation in Britain of the future depicts the life in the year 2000. Uh, the tendency, as often happens, is to overstate the speed and reach of change. Get this. We should assume a peaceful world and a plan on that basis. Mm, mm, no. Um, humanity has been around for thousands of years. Peaceful has never really been our thing. We will, we will be able to choose the sex of our children. Well, that's true. 
and we're talking about messing with DNA, it can be done. And in the future, we can even select offspring with superior mathematical abilities. It's terrifying splicing and dicing of our own genetic material. It's crazy. But this aired in the 60s. And I mean, we've, oh man, the, the, some of the selective stuff that people are doing and you can actually go ahead and, and pick and choose the DNA, particularly in the, in the world of uh, surrogacy or even in, in sperm donat- uh, donations, it's kind of tricky. A little, little, little sauce there. Uh, let's see. Uh, but some of the information they got correct in this Britain of the future, the televisions itself we can expect the screen to get bigger, but the set to get much slimmer. In fact, it's sometimes said now that it might be possible to make the television set so slim that it could be hung on the wall. Fascinating. And of course, how many of us hang our TVs on a wall? The GE Kitchen, this one from 1956, is a subtle plug for the frigid air appliances. Once again, our hero, a housewife, dances and twirls through a futuristic kitchen narration, describing the magnificence of her life. Tick-tock, tick-tock, I'm free to have fun around the clock. Thanks to the automated oven that alerts her with a chime when the food is finished. You'll note that her refrigerator is glass-doored so she can see what's inside. I mean, isn't that kind of normal? Bell Systems, uh, in this corporate video in 6465, uh, the World's Fair, uh, Bell Systems showed off a system it was developing. Uh, first, what we now know of or remember as the pager, keeping in touch by the means of the amazing new bellboy. It's a Bell Systems answer for doctors, salesmen, delivery men, etc. I, I mean, this is in 50, 6465. I mean, everyone had a pager at one point. Whether you had any necessity other than family needed to reach you, you had one. They also showed off touch tone dialing, which would be introduced the year following year. So obviously touch tone is going from the old rotary phones. Just listen for a dial tone, insert a number card and press the start bar. Whoa, what is that? The automatic dialer? Insert the, oh, you just put it in and it would run it? Weird. And then uh, direct distance calling, most calls go through in 20 seconds or less. Because there was a time where you could not do a long-distance call without going through an operator. Let's see. Arthur C. Clarke nails almost all of his predictions. This is back in 1964 for the year up through the year 2014, including wireless communication. So get this. We can be in instant contact with each other wherever we may be. It will be possible in that age, perhaps only 50 years from now, from a man to conduct his business from Tahiti or Bali, just as well as he could from London. This was not thought of as being a normal possibility back then. Sure, there were like telegraphs and telephones and uh, still a lot of things were done the old-fashioned way. I mean, boats were still carrying things. It, It really is a lot of progress in a really short period of time, essentially in our Lifetimes. Remember, 64, 65 is the earliest, you know, Gen Xer. That's a lot that we have witnessed. It's really amazing. Um, men will no longer commute. They will communicate. They will travel only for pleasure. Huh, well, that's not exactly the case. But here's something interesting that Arthur C. Clarke said. Trying to predict the future is discouraging. Hazardous occupation because the prophet invariably falls between two stools. If his predictions sound at all reasonable, you can be quite sure that within 20 or almost 50 years, the progress of science and technology has made him seem ridiculously conservative. On the other hand, if by some miracle a prophet could describe the future exactly as it was going to take place, his predictions would sound so absurd, so far-fetched, that everyone would laugh him to scorn. Yeah. Kind of the, kind of the whole thing. That's kind of how prophets, religious prophets of of biblical times felt. And anyone who came out and said, hey, we need to do X, Y, Z, some kind of change, whether it's in in society, in in engineering, mathematics, building, whatever it is. Yeah, I mean, it's really true. 
if if you go all in and say we're going to have all these bells and whistles, um, somehow we'll eclipse it. And yeah, it's it's uh, prescient, if you will. So then, of course, very quickly, another thing from the '60s, you know, is is you know talking about Asmanov because you called his uh, an article that he wrote. This is in the New York Times fifty years ago. Well, actually, uh, excuse me, um, sixty years ago. Because 2014 was 10 years ago. Holy cow. Wow. Anyway, um, because this article is by David Pogue. Uh, These last two articles were both in Scientific American. And uh, projections fall into two categories. One that came to pass and one who didn't. So anticipating self-driving cars, video calling, widespread use of nuclear power, and single duty Household robots. I mean, yeah, Roombas, for example. He also worried about population, estimating 2014 world population to be 6.5 billion and U.S. to reach 350. Really close, by the way. Actual world population is 7.1 and the U.S. tally is 317 million. But he also got a lot wrong. He's looking at underground and underwater homes becoming popular. No. Cars and boats that levitate on jets uh, of compressed air. No. Uh, The disease of boredom. Now, that's so interesting because this article is, I don't know, kind of poo-pooing it a little bit. But the lucky few who can be involved in creative work of any sort will be the truly elite of mankind, for they alone will do more than serve a machine. Basically saying that... All the machinery will take away any kind of work. But to say that we'll be bored, I don't know. It's, I don't know how all of that really plays out if we were to move to a fully automated society for, from a labor perspective. I don't know. That's above my pay grade. Windows, get this. He thought windows would be an archaic touch thanks to the popularity of glowing wall panels. Now, I see these and I hate them. But I'm fortunate enough to live in an area that's relatively picturesque. Now, if I were still living in the city, I mean, I get it. Sometimes you you just have an ugly apartment and it's just it's just brick and steel around you. I can imagine the appeal of having a nice country scene from a soft glow of a wall panel. I do. I fully get it. Even just for. Uh, seasonal dis- uh, affective kind of disorders. Having a UV style light would be really, really cool. But I don't know if that becomes the the commonplace. It's scary. But hey, let's jump into the article I really wanted to to kind of talk about. Really simple. Ten times. Eighty sci-fi movies predicted the future. Now, some of these I've already mentioned in quick passing. But let's talk about Back to the Future number two. This is coming, by the way, from Screen Rant, uh, published in 2019 by Jacob Boren. But Back to the Future 2, 1989, wearable computers. In the second movie, we see Marty's younger son watching television through his glasses. Google Glasses did hit the market in 2014. Google sold those prototypes for around $1,500, right? $1,500. Uh, Oculus Rift. Now we have the uh, Apple Vision Pro. We have the Meta. What are they called? Meta. Is Meta? Oculus is a different company, right? Meta Goggles. Meta. I don't know. Zuckerberg, those things, you know what I mean. But all of these things, even in 2019, you know, talking here that they're still in their infancy, they really still are, but the progress is startling. Now, I've heard a lot of mixed reviews about all these things, whether it's the Google Glasses or the Vision Pro is getting startlingly, I think, really divisive reviews. I mean, I can't imagine walking around this with this thing on my head all the time. So these people who are walking around 
just walking down the street, you see them in the crosswalk doodling and doing all these things, you know, gesticulating in the air as they're modifying something that they're seeing. I mean, I don't, I don't see that necessarily becoming our future. Do I see practical applications of something like Google Glasses that function, I think, better, more early? I don't know. I, I could see some real benefits of that. But it's also, I imagine, really taxing on your brain. What I mean by that is, if I'm driving down the road, I can look at my GPS, right? And I have one of the in-panel with the, the car play. But can you imagine that it's in your glasses and you're just, you're seeing it right there while you're also seeing the road? I can see the overlay right there. You think of it very much like video games. That seems like a lot for your brain to process. I don't know. I know that sounds like a, an old man thing to say, but that seems like sensory overload. Whereas at least you're looking at these different things in the real world. It just seems a little bit less straining because we're already talking about how much we strain our eyes with blue light. And now you're going to put that thing right up into your head. No, there's got to be some risks with all this. And supposedly there's some headset that like if you die in a game, again, I know it's conspiracy theory stuff, but supposedly there's one designer who says, no, it'll shut your brain off. Who knows what's real nowadays? So I've never heard of this movie. Never heard of it. If you have, let me know. Electric Dreams from 1984. And I think this is a horror movie. But Home Automation. So this movie from 1984 revolves around the dawn of PCs and how they integrated themselves into our daily lives. Even home appliances. By the way, I have a really smart toaster. The thing is badass. I don't care. And this was much like, I guess, Hal. Thankfully, we have a much better relationship with our automated appliances. Thanks to technological, technological work such as Alexa, a, home, a small home computer can take control of pretty much anything we let it. But I mean, what is it trying to say here? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? While our home appliances aren't hell-bent on killing us. But I mean... You've just said that you, you've you given Alexa complete control over everything. I'll be honest. I don't have the Alexa environment. I don't have Siri active on my phone. And I will say the amount of random targeted ads that you say something out loud and that pops up your phone has reduced since I've turned off all of those settings so that my microphone is not running 24-7. And it really has reduced the number of things that just pop up automatically from conversation. Your phone is listening. And if you have Alexa and all those kind of things, and, and you know, if you can talk to Siri as easily as, hey, Siri, guess what? You know, I'd much rather have to do the, the very difficult work of typing something in to search for it specifically, you know what I mean, than just have it listening. I know, old man stuff, right? Why would you be concerned if the government wants to know they're going to know? Is my FBI agent listening to this right now? If so, uh, hey, buddy, how you doing? Weird Science 1985. What was that all about? Do you, do you know? 3D printing. I mean, that's not exactly what they were aiming for. But if you think about it, that's all it was. It was 3D printing. And the actual uses, like I said, you know, not exactly how they do it for real, but you can always make yourself a snappy replica of whatever you find suitable. Now, I think about this all the time when I go to church. You think about weird science? No, no, no. That would be inappropriate. I think about little repair things that are probably so far, like so old that you're not going to be able to find a lot of easily accessible replacement parts for things that you could just be doing this with a 3D printer. I'm thinking about just buying a 3D printer and saying, what random little piece of something where everything else is perfectly good, perfectly suitable, but this one piece is missing and you could replicate it. That would be amazing. It has a very practical use, but weird science, 3D printing. Now, here's Blade Runner getting it right. Like I said, 
the flying cars didn't happen. I remember asking my dad, dad, is that even possible? It's like, I guess it could be like, but uh, yeah, I, I don't even remember how he tried to explain the th- theoretically making the flying car possible. What they did have though, digital billboards. These are very common now where you could go ahead and have five, six, various different advertisers, each one a revenue stream, by the way. And you could use the one billboard, whereas before it would be one billboard. It would be up for a certain period of time. Maybe you're renting it for a week, a month, six months, whatever it is. By the way, get yourself billboard. Holy cow. You can find they, they they come up for sale on occasion. They're getting bought up though by your live nations and all these kind of things because it's an easy revenue stream. Particularly when you have the digital ones. Oh, new ad. Just put it up. It's there. Loaded in, ready to roll. It is fantastic money to rent out a billboard. But Blade Runner, they got that right. The Terminator drones. Military drones. Now, they could have put military robots, but we're going to talk about military robots in a little bit. But the T-800s aren't the only tool in Skynet's arsenal. In many of the future war scenes, drones are clearly visible and absolutely destroying everything on the ground. Think about that. War drones. The first ever military drone was put to the test in 2002. And the CIA placed Osama bin Laden as his first target, supposedly. Since then, the drones have only gotten more volatile in terms of firepower and software. Now, I don't know how they're using volatile, volatile because I think of that as being something that is, um, if a person is volatile, they, they're, they're prone to snap. Now, what are they saying? The drones have gotten more dangerous standalone by themselves? Like, are we putting it completely into the computer brain and not telling it what the target is? That would be terrifying. If it's just scanning the countryside and going, huh, hey, there's my target. That's not where I think we are. So I'm not sure if they really meant volatile. Maybe they they mean it's become more efficient killing machine. Very possible. Absolutely true. But hey, there we are. Terminator, 1984. War Games, 1983. You know I don't fuck with Broderick, but anyway. Cyber Warfare. This is sadly here to stay. Absolutely here to stay. And this is at a time in 83 that computer systems were still gradually becoming the norm. And nowhere near as interconnected as we are today. You know, um, hacking concepts were explored and explained to the public simply for it. Uh, uh, wait, uh, hold on. This is probably one of the most spot on predictions on the list. And the whole movie served as a warning for a cyber connected world. War games predicted cyber warfare or hacking way before mainstream Internet was even a thing and managed to stick with audiences despite it. I don't know if they're trying to say that the movie stuck. Because they said it a couple enough times, a couple of times now. Hacking concepts were explored and explained to the public simply enough for it to stick. Like they're they're trying to make the concept of hacking stick with the audience as they're going to remember it. I, I don't know that that many people gave a flying rat's ass about war games in 1983. I remember it being very much a teen driven kind of thing. At least I remember it as being so. I also found it to be a remarkably boring movie, but typically anytime Broderick's on the screen, I am bored to tears. But they are saying this is where uh, it also notes war driving, which where you essentially drive around for suitable Wi-Fi networks to hack. War games use the term firewall first as well, and the term stuck immediately. <clears throat> they just like to say stick, stuck, stuck all over this article. Oh, my gosh. You're killing me with that piece. Somebody loves war games. It's the author of this particular article, Mr. Jacob Boren. Boren. Perfect. No offense, guy. By the way, Jacob Boren, if you're listening to the podcast, I'm like, sorry about that. I, I didn't I didn't mean to offend you. Mad Max 2. The Road Warrior. 
Nobody calls him Mad Max to the United States. They just say Road Warrior. Let's be honest. 1981, Resource Wars. Now, we're not really there yet in, in, in terms of an actual conflict, but it does talk about oil-rich countries. And this is what they're trying to make some comparisons to. Countries like Chad and the Congo, where people are fighting over resources. But really, you can say, I suppose, that every major conflict that we've had in the latter part of the 20th century into the early 21st century has been related to resources. If you believe that any and all things related to the war on terror is really the war for oil. Some people believe that. Some people don't. I think it's probably both. I think you're you're fighting terrorism, which for whatever reason happens to be uh, manufactured in some ways. I, I think, I don't want to say pushed, but there's radicalization that comes from the part of the world that just so happens to be resource rich. I don't know what that means, but oftentimes it's because resource rich countries have ultra rich people at the very, very top. And then they have people who are much poor and the poorer you are, the chances for radicalization tend to happen. So then you also have governments and governments like you have something I want. Uh, yeah. Resource wars. But yeah, I, I think that became more, I think it was more fleshed out as an idea in the most recent Mad Max movie where they really took their time out to talk about why hoarding resources such as water and how, um, what's his name? Oh my gosh. Uh, Joe, uh, Imperia Joe, Imperius Joe, something Joe, Immortan Joe. That's it. Immortan Joe. And, Do not get addicted to water, for you will know its absence as he hoards the water, right? You will miss it when it's not there. That's fucking insane. Um, Anyway, Short Circuit, 1986. In some ways, very similar to the drones, military robots, because that's what Johnny Five was. He was meant to be a military robot and came equipped with both offensive and defensive features for the front lines. And we have UGVs, unmanned ground vehicles, that lack many risks humane personnel would bring, right? So war robots, this has been talked about for such a long time, but really came into the forefront in the 80s. Now, here's one that is both Meant to be lighthearted, but then also shows how satirical films tend to really push buttons on on reality. So Airplane 2, the sequel, 1982, airport body scanners. So think about that. This prediction really started out as a gag, and the movie is one that you really love or hate, but the little gadget was found funny. But then 30 years later, It actually happened. Now, supposedly they say that you can't have these kind of scanners anymore. So when I go into that little room and I put my arms up over my head, that's not a full nudie scanner. They're not looking at everything. I thought they were. I just came to go ahead and accept it. Now, that says something terrible for me, which is, hey, you're just going to go along. Well, if I want to fly, yes. Or I have to say, I don't want to go through your scanner. So now you're going to touch me all over. I guess it depends on the mood I'm in that day, but okay. You want to take a look? Go ahead, take a look. It's better than being felt up. Because for the longest time, particularly right after post 9 11, I don't know if it was like the leather jacket I wore or, or my facial hair at the time, but man, I would get pulled out of the line all the time. Oh, it's just random, sir. Every time though, just me. I don't know. It looked, I looked sus, I guess, but body scanners, real thing. Meant to be a gag, turned out to be real. Holograms. Now, this was talked about not just in Escape from New York. So in 1981, Escape from New York. I love how this goes. Escape from New York is without a doubt one of Kurt Russell's best movies. Well, it's it's Kurt Russell and John Carpenter. They're like a match made in heaven. The Thing, Escape from New York, Escape from L.A. Of course, you know, you can't forget about Big Trouble in Little China. I mean, perfect match made in heaven. 
But alongside a personal assault rifle that he adorns throughout the movie, he's also equipped with a personal hologram projector that he can use to send and receive messages. Yeah. And now we have holograms of Elvis and Tupac and Michael Jackson and Dio. Apparently you can go see Dio with Dio's original band. Like I think Vivian Campbell played for some of it too. And it's not even Dio. It's just a hologram Dio. People are going to pay to go see Dio in concert. And there's a hologram. And then, of course, you have Kiss, who have just wrapped up their 50th retirement tour. And they're switching to, and they're using the, the hip lingo, avatars. They're not calling them holograms. They're Kiss avatars. You're going to go see the Kiss avatars in concert in Las Vegas, supposedly. Now, I'm not sure if people will go and see this, but if that turns out to be your only way to go see Kiss and you love Kiss and you're in Vegas, I'd probably go. I've only seen unmakeup Kiss in concert. I'd, I'd probably go see a show if I had nothing else to do if I was in Vegas. Why not? I mean, what's the, what could it hurt? It's just like going to see a movie or any other show that you would go to pay money for. I, I don't know. But anyway, some of these devices, some of, of the future, it's not exactly like we maybe expected. So yes, we have a Roomba, but that's not Rosie from the Jetsons. But their TV system is basically what we expected. And Mr. Spacely could call. So the Jetsons also had basically online fitness classes, right? You, you, you know, what was her name? So let's see, Judy is the daughter, Jane. So Jane would do exercise classes in front of the big monitor. And it would be a live instructor going through the exercises. This is what you do remotely. This is long before that was even a, a rational thought. Now, I think the Jetsons were meant to be, let's see. I think they're already supposed to be in our timeline. Um, let's see. The Jetsons reside in Orbit City. What year? It doesn't say. Do you know there was only three seasons of the original Jetsons? That's crazy. I could have sworn that went on for way longer. Um, there has got to be something here. Because I think it talked about how George's birthday was coming up or something. And that... Um, sorry, I kind of jumped off on this whole Jetsons thing here, and it was a rather abrupt segue. The Jetsons age. Let's try that, shall we? George and Jane Jetson are officially 40 and 33. Wow. Their oldest child, Judy, is 16, which means that Jane was around 16 or 17. She was pregnant with her. The age difference means that George was 24 and he impregnated Jane. Wow. Okay. okay. More than I needed to know. Huh. And now everything about this article, every article that's coming up is talking about this age difference. Oh, gosh. Why, why, did, I, why did I look at the internet for something like this? Oh, that's so depressing. I think what they were, tr what I was really looking for is that oh, that's so depressing. So the Jetsons supposedly took place in the a hundred years? So it's supposed to be 2062. So it's supposed to be a hundred years into the future. Um, I'm going to try one other thing. Sorry about this. 
uh, George Jetson birthday. Ah, July 31st, 2022. Yes. So it, if he was 40, that's 2062. So it was meant to be a hundred years in the future. So maybe, maybe you're going to have flying vehicles, little spacecraft in 2062. Maybe that will be commonplace, but some of that technology already existing is pretty fascinating. I mean, it really is. Some of the things are kind of crazy, um, but it's kind of sweet to think that they, you know, people still have dogs, but I would like a, like a housekeeper. That would be pretty great because Rosie was cool. But would that then be one of those home devices that wants to kill us? Probably. And I didn't even mention maximum overdrive, which also ties into the whole Skynet, Hal, the Matrix. And with all the stuff going on with AI, not to beat a dead horse, but, oh, man, is there any hope for humanity? Is there any hope for mankind? I don't know. I hope so. But this is not exactly the future that was promised us by Star Trek and Star Wars and the Jetsons and Blade Runner and all these things and and Back to the Future some of the stuff they got right, some of the stuff they got way wrong. So what other things did you expect to have by now? What advances do you think that we're on the precipice of reaching? I'm curious to know what your thoughts are. And if you put much stock into what media presents as potential futures, or even some of the things that are happening around us, is this all just, you know, one big stupid TV show. Who knows? But I'd love to know your thoughts. How can you do that? You can email me at stuck in the middle pod at yahoo.com. You can find me on Instagram, X, and YouTube at StuckPodX. Head on over to the Facebook page, Stuck in the Middle, a Gen X podcast. Please like, comment, share, leave five star reviews, and most importantly, please subscribe to the podcast. So until next time, later slackers.